Okay, greetings, everybody. Thanks for showing up today. Uh, my name is Raheem Skinner, and I'll be your subject matter expert um, throughout the lesson today. And today's topic is suicide awareness and prevention for managers. All right. Um, again, my name is Raheem Skinner. I've got about 21 years of mental health experience. Um, some of that dealing directly with suicide and not suicide awareness uh, for civilians uh, and non mental health care workers. And so uh, this class uh, is going to be probably one of my favorites. All right. All right, let's get started. <clears throat> All right, so by the end of this training today, hopefully I uh, will know the difference between some myths that are out there and some facts about suicide. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to recognize warning signs uh, for when a person is at risk for uh, suicide or ending their life. And then we'll talk about intervening uh, with a potential uh, risk person at risk for self-harm or suicide. I will talk about the conversation, right? Um, how do you have a conversation with somebody that you think is at uh, risk or uh, has a potential for self-harm or suicide? Uh, we'll talk about how to take care of yourself, right? Um, secondary trauma uh, occurs when we um, see things, hear things, uh, not necessarily us, but when we were involved in traumatic situations, right? So like collateral, uh, collateral um, risk and trauma. And we'll talk about getting help for employees, okay? So one of the myths about suicide, right? Uh, one of the most pervasive myths is that somebody who talks about it won't really do it, right? And I hear that all the time, all over the country and people uh, generally say that, you know, they say, hey, well, I know somebody and they say it all the time. They, they, po they post it on Facebook all the time. Um, so certainly it can't be true, right? Um, the fact is that when somebody talks about suicide, they may be asking for help um, in some form, right? And sometimes that help isn't necessarily for suicide. It may be a root cause. And so they're seeking um, attention, right? And we call that attention seeking behavior. Um, in mental health, we call it that. Um, and so one of the quickest ways to get attention is to talk about harming yourself or someone else, right? And most healthcare, uh, even legal avenues, um, that's a red flag that can get you seen quickly. Right. And so um, people who talk about suicide uh, consistently, they may be looking for help uh, for something else. Right. And using suicide as a um, as a, a, a way to garner attention. Right. Um, one of my first trainings about suicide, um, I was in a room full of school counselors and one of the school counselors said the same thing about a student that was pretty well known amongst other school counselors. And the lead school counselor they said, you know, what do we do about this one uh, student? She's always using suicide as a way to get attention. I never forget the lead school counselor. She said she told him she told them to give her attention was her answer. And so I always remember that. Right. And it says always take the person seriously. And so if we can't get to the root problem uh, right off, then at least um, giving that person attention and hopefully trying to figure out what their uh, need is slash what their true need is. Um, it's an opportunity. Right. And so we want to take those times and, and opportunities to um, see if we can help, right, and get to the bottom of what's really going on. All right, another myth. The majority of suicides happen suddenly without any previous warnings, right? And so we know that some happen without warnings. Uh, most suicides have some type of um, verbal or behavioral indicator. All right, so suicidology is a branch of science that studies on suicide, that uh, focuses and studies on suicides, right? And so the American Association for Suicidology includes impulsivity as an acute suicide risk factor. Uh, research doesn't support that. And so people who are impulsive, right? So maybe um, diagnosis wise, it would be uh, like ADHD, um, maybe schizophrenia, people with schizophrenia, schizoaffective maybe, or uh, mania. Um, uh, the, the up part of bipolar um, disorder, right? Uh, those things have impulsivity as a um, attachment as a symptom, right? And so uh, things, uh, people with those diagnoses are assumed or um, hypothesized to uh, be at risk for suicide more than people who don't have those diagnoses, right? Um, so while that's thought, not proven or true yet, but while that's thought, um, 
most suicides have uh, risk or have some type of verbal or behavioral indicator the week previous. So up to seven days um, before the suicide, um, there are signs that we try to watch for, right? Um, another myth, only people with mental disorders die by suicide, right? Uh, we know that's not true, right? The fact is suicidal behavior indicates someone in despair, but not necessarily indicative of a mental disorder. Many people with mental illness don't have suicidal ideation and not all people who die by suicide have mental health issues, right? About this one, a person who has attempted suicide will never attempt it again. The fact is, previous suicide attempts are a key risk factor for likelihood for future attempts, right? That's one of the questions that we ask, one of the first questions, uh, first three questions we ask a person that says that they are thinking about suicide, you know, I'm, it's pretty common knowledge. Do you have a plan? Um, uh, do you have the stuff you need to complete it? Have you ever attempted before, right? So it's pretty early in the question process um, because the previous suicide attempt um, indicates a 75% higher likelihood that a person will carry through on their uh, uh, suicidal ideation, right? Than a person who's never tried it before, right? So um, that's a big risk factor. All right, some fun, some facts. Um, so in the United States, um, second leading cause of the deaths in, in youth 10 to 24 years old, right? And in North Carolina, um, just for information's sake, uh, they were number one, suicide was number one uh, leading cause of death in 10 to uh, 24 year olds in the year 2019, right? And so uh, in some states, it's number one. Um, in the US, it's 10th leading cause of death uh, of all citizens in the US, right? White males age 50, 45 to 54 um, are the highest risk categorization. And a lot of people um, are surprised by that, right? We think that it's either younger people, uh, maybe minorities. Um, generally people think it's males though, but uh, it's older white males is I think the surprising part that is older uh, people. Um, almost 70% of suicides in the US are completed by um, white males age 45 to 54. Uh, a little, uh, it's about 40, 40, 47,500 suicide deaths in 2019, 1. 1.4 million attempts in that year, right? They say men die by suicide almost three and a, over three and a half times that of females. Women attempt more often, but men are more successful. Women attempt suicide uh, three, uh, 75 percent more times than men. Men complete the action of suicide uh, three and uh, over three and a half times more than females. Uh, uh, just about half of suicides are done by firearm. All right, so it's 47,500 in total. About 24,000 of those, um, a little less than half, um, a little more than half, excuse me, are done by firearm. Right, and we'll talk about they're easily accessible. Um, they're legal. Um, and again, when you factor in impulsivity, uh, maybe drug use or substance use, then those things don't go together well, right? And we call that a lethal triad. Um, let's see. Let's talk about warning signs of potential suicide. So we talked about initially that previous suicide attempt. So if we know somebody has attempted to take their life in the past, that's a great big red flag. It's worth, worth, 10, red, it's worth 10 tiny red flags, okay? A uh, tiny red flag might be a subtle indication, like um, I need to get my affairs in order, right? Does that inherently necessarily mean that somebody is thinking about taking their life? No, right? In context, it doesn't, right? Uh, so we, that would be an opportunity for a conversation. So if somebody says, hey, I need to get my affairs in order, then of course we might say, okay, why is that? What's going on? You know, and they could say, well, I'm just doing some estate planning. I want to make sure I have my things in order for my kids or anything. Right. We want to get clarification on that. But when we know somebody has attempted suicide in the past, then, like I said, that's that's an um, indicator that they're more likely to um, complete the act again. Right. A person with a history of mental health issues. Right. So diagnosed mental health issues or um, they've been to the uh, state hospital or they, they see uh, are seeking therapy, then that's uh, another red flag. Right. Um, so that's something we want to be mindful of as well. 
uh, changes in medications. Uh, medications can have uh, side effects, and they do. We've all seen the commercials where it's supposed to get rid of um, one thing, but it causes 10 other things, right, while it's doing its job. And so some of those side effects can be emotional health um, or psychosis, right? Some medications uh, like the, uh, the medicine that helps people with cigarette uh, cessation, uh, Chantix has been known to cause uh, uh, psychosis, right, or lucid dreaming things like that. And so there's a warning. And so you, um, you have to be under your doctor's care when you take it. Um, and you should communicate with your doctor when you take things like that. And so if a person began having suicidal ideology while taking um, a medicine that caused psychosis, it, it's the same as impulsivity, right? And so those two things will go well together. And so we will want to keep an eye on that person when they have that first med change. Um, <clears throat> a person in pain, right? So uh, we're talking about like, um, chronic uh, diagnosis, uh, chronic physical diagnosis, so like fibro, not fibromyalgia, but maybe um, uh, uh, severe back pain, um, uh, cancer terminal diagnosis of any disease, uh, things like that, emotional pain. So we're talking about grief, excuse me, we're talking about like grief and uh, people who've experienced death and dying and loss. Um, we just wanna check in. Those things are red flags as well. So. A person who's increased substance use, uh, alcohol or drugs, um, we want to keep an eye on them. That's also a red flag. Um, a person who feels like uh, they have no reason for living or no purpose in life, you know, they don't know what they're here for and like they're just flailing around. Um, we want to keep an eye on that. That's a red flag. And a person that feels like they have no way out of a situation, right? And so that could be um, anything. That could be abuse. That can be a bad job. That could just be like overwhelmed and they don't see a way out. And so that's a red flag. And so I tell people the thing about red flags is that one red flag does not a um, suicidal person make, right? Not necessarily two. There's no magic number. But I say that the more we get the more red flags we get, you know, the more serious uh, our gut instinct um, should be paid attention to. It, it, it's more important that we listen to our gut, right? Um, so for increased substance use, for example, right? Um, let's say we got a John, right? And John is every Friday, everybody at work goes out and John enjoys having a good time let's say that and that's pretty standard fare right and so that's that's one thing and so when john is having a good time and he's drinking and everybody's having a good time that in and of itself is not a red flag now we go um to the same bar same employee group and john starts isolating I mean he's sitting by himself and he's still drinking or drinking more but that's a red flag right that's an opportunity for a conversation and you want to marry that with the fact that you know maybe john um uh, has been talking about his severe pain, his doctor changed his medicine, uh, he may be going through a divorce, um, his job is not secure, and he's isolating and drinking, and that's a lot of red flags. And so somebody probably needs to have that conversation with John just to get a pulse on how he's doing. You know, I know you're going through a lot. Um, let's talk, you know, I'm here for you, things like that. Uh, also, feelings of hopelessness and helplessness um, will draw from friends. I was talking about the isolation, family and society, so staying away from people. Um, uh, another branch of impulsivity is uh, rage, right? And so anger and then rage is, is, is a higher, more extreme form of anger, right? It's uncontrolled, um, usually lashes out um, and seeks revenge. You know, rage is... Um, usually directed at somebody and oftentimes it's accompanied by a sense that they did something to me. So I'll show them that, that kind of thinking, right? Um, recklessness, risky, uh, activities, uh, either without, it says it's seemingly without thinking, meaning that you, they're just doing stuff that is, just, you know, wild, even if they're a wild person already, I'm wild meaning, um, adventurous. Okay. So promiscuity, um, uh, affairs, uh, just without thinking, just out of the box, then they haven't been like that. Now they're, you know, picking up prostitutes, they're trying out drugs, and those things are definitely red flags uh, for a number of reasons. Dramatic mood changes. So one of the things that's um, emotionally interesting about, um, about people that take their life um, is that 
generally speaking, if somebody, if we know someone that's taking their life, a lot of times people are saying, hey, you know, I saw them the week before. They were so happy and upbeat. Um, it's hard to imagine why they did this. Uh, generally, a person makes a plan and once they make that plan, you know, their attitude usually changes because the weight that they felt, that burden that they felt like they had has been lifted because they have a plan to to end it, right? And so their attitude usually changes and they become happier, more upbeat. And that's when we see them and we say, hey, I'm, everything looks like it's turning around for this person. And then if they take their life successfully, um, we're usually confused and wondering, you know, what happened. And um, so that mood change is a huge one. Um, and it works in the reverse. A uh, person that's usually happy-go-lucky becomes upset or withdrawn. And um, that's also an indicator as well. Um, giving away prized possessions or seeking long-term care for pets. That's right. Those things are red flags. Um, again, in and of themselves, it means not nothing um, inherently, right? So, for example, giving away prized possessions or seeking long-term care for pets. I have a friend. Um, he's a avid gun collector and so if he called me and said hey i'm going to pick up a new rifle or a shotgun or a handgun or whatever I, it would probably wouldn't raise any flags with me because that's that's just him he's definitely part for the course um he's he has a ton of guns right now more concerning is if he called me and said hey raheem um i want to give you one of my favorite firearms then i would be very concerned about that um i would it would open up an opportunity for, for questions, you know? Um, so why are you doing this? What's your motivation behind it? How are things going? Um, because that would not be like him at all. And so um, a lot of these red flags um, in context would be an opportunity for a conversation. One or more, two or more, three or more are, are definitely um, a conversation needs to happen, at least to get a pulse on where the person is at and how they're feeling. Right. So those things that we talked about previously um, are kind of subtle. Right. Like I said, it could be um, one, one, two, three of those things and still not mean anything. Right. You can have a person giving you a gift because they just value your friendship and it means nothing other than that. Um, they could have lost their job. Um, they could be getting a divorce and they realize that, hey, you know, I'm going through all this stuff. and You've always been there for me. I just want to share a gift with you. No, I'm not going to harm myself. Um, but I know that, you know, you're my friend, right? So that's three red flags, but they can not, not inherently mean anything. These are high risk warning signs. So one of these things um, is more than likely an indicator that a person wants to hurt or kill themselves, right? And so the first one is very direct. Person that threatens to hurt or kill him or herself or talks about wanting to hurt or kill him or herself. That's very direct and it leaves no room for imagination. That's an automatic, um, stop right uh, a person looking for ways to kill themselves by seeking access and access to firearms pills or other means um, we know that men usually take um, more uh, lethal means to end their life so firearms maybe hanging things like that and women tend to use less less lethal means uh, maybe gas or um, poison like pills or overdoses and things like that right um, talking or writing about death, dying or suicide when the actions are out of the ordinary. And so if you've got a friend that's a morbid artist, it's probably not out of the ordinary for them. If you have a friend that's not a morbid artist and they start drawing pictures, they're just infatuated with death. Again, inherently nothing, but it's something that it's an opportunity for discussion, especially if they're talking about death all of a sudden, or what would, what would your life be like without me here? Right? Those types of conversations. That's usually an indicator that they're thinking about taking their life. And again, a previous suicide attempt ups the ante every time. If a person has tried in the past and they're doing anything to make you think that they're um, thinking about taking their life, then it should be met with all seriousness. And um, All right. So this is uh, the three-step theory. All right. So it feels like, um, well, I'm sorry. It, Research has shown that the combination of pain and hopelessness uh, sometimes brings about suicidal ideation. Okay, so when a person feels like they're in pain and they have no way out, right, they tend to um, look for a way out. And one of the common solutions is uh, is uh, suicide. All right, and so connectedness uh, lowers the risk. Okay, so a person who has loved ones, who has a 
a val excuse me, a valued role or any sense of meaning or purpose lowers the risk for experiencing pain and hopelessness, right? And so uh, that's what we talk about community, right? We talk about networking, um, we talk about checking in on others and especially checking on our strong friends, right? It's a pretty common phrase that's uh, gotten really big in the past couple of years. They say, hey, check on your strong friends. And that's exactly what this is about. Um, that sense of connectedness, right? That you're not alone in this, right? And so it's that uh, type of thinking. Um, automatically lowers the risk of a person experiencing pain and hopelessness that they will not take their own life. Uh, suicide ideation leads to suicide attempts if and only if there's a capacity for an attempt. So like easy access to a lethal mean, a low pain threshold, uh, they face death, injury, and pain, so they're less fearful, right? Um, one of the reasons that a previous suicide attempt uh, is such a high risk factor is because they've, um, generally they face death on their own terms by their own hand before. And so that, that filter that um, most people have that says I can't end my own life or I don't wanna die, they've already jumped through that filter. So that's missing, right? And so it's been established. And so the hesitancy or the, um, the hesitancy or the, the whatever factors are there that stop people who've never attempted is not there for them, right? And so um, we talk about that capacity for an attempt, right? And so we talk about uh, firearm ownership, which isn't inherently bad, of course, right? And so, but if a person owns a firearm, then that's easy access, right? If a person has uh, narcotics in their home, um, legal or, uh, or illegal narcotics in their home, then it's easy access, right? <clears throat> All right, so now we talk about the conversations and what happens um, when we have to talk to someone, right? And so that first bullet, reflect back recent observations and connect that to why you're asking. And so a good way to start any conversation about anything uh, that you wanna to talk to somebody about is I have noticed, right? So when you start with I have noticed, it's it de um, it's it's not, they, the person doesn't become defensive, it de-arms um, this arms the person that you're talking to because it's hard to argue what I've seen and I'm telling you what I've observed right now. I'm, I'm not telling you that, hey, you've been drinking, you've been doing more drugs than normal um, like that. And that's that would make somebody become defensive and want to tell you that, hey, I haven't been, you know, and it becomes an argument really quickly. Right. We talk about things we've noticed. We say things like I've noticed you're more confused um, at work and I'm concerned about you. Is everything OK? Right. And so I know you care. I know that uh, you've seen me uh, not at my best and you're asking, is everything OK? It's a great opportunity for me to share that everything is not OK. Right. And second one is I recently have noticed some differences in you and wondered how you're doing. Um, I wanted to check in with you because you haven't seen yourself lately. How's everything going? Right. So talk like that. And then we want to actively listen without judgment, right? If we put ourselves in a situation to uh, talk to someone, we want to listen to them, right? Um, not a good time for a judgment or uh, uh, philosophical criticisms. You know, we want to listen to that person and kind of learn what brought them here to where they are. And then we want to be prepared to offer resources, um, internal resources, tell them about uh, employee assistance program, EAP. We want to tell them about HR or any other internal resources, right? We want to talk to that person and give them help and hope, right? Because remember, we talked about hope. A person that has hope is, is less likely to try to take their own life. Uh, there's another statistic. Um, any intervention uh, for a person that is at risk of taking their own life is 97% uh, likely to stop a suicide attempt, right? So out of 100 people, <clears throat> any positive interaction will stop that suicide attempt 97 times out of 100 times. That's a really high statistic. And a positive intervention can be anything. It can be something as simple as, I just wanted to check in with you because you haven't seemed like yourself lately. And then you save a life, right? <clears throat> All right, so what if we have an employee that's at risk uh, for suicide or self-harm or is at greater risk uh, for suicide or self-harm? Yep, so it's 
called the fatality component. Right. So sometimes uh, we have to be direct and suicide is one of those ways to act it uh, to uh, to be direct. It's one of those ways. Um, it's one of those times that we get to be direct and are asking a person um, exactly what's going on. Right. Um, if you're more seriously concerned about potential suicide, be prepared to ask using the fatality component. Otherwise, their person's brain may not get it. Right. And so we generally assume that uh, everybody has the same um, stigma about suicide and it's just not true um some cultures just don't have that stigma at all right and so some people don't because once they've um identified suicide as a solution to a problem there is no negative stigma attached to it for that person and so we wouldn't do well to say hey are you thinking about hurting yourself because in their mind they just don't see it like that they see it as a relief right the same is true for a person that does self-harm you know cutting or uh, slashing or picking skin picking when you talk about self-harm they just don't see it like that and so you say you're thinking about hurting yourself they may say no and they may genuinely believe that they're not thinking about hurting themselves and so one of the easiest way or best ways to um, ask that question is say hey you know have you been thinking about suicide are you thinking about taking your life um and then that way it kind of goes straight to the core of what we're talking about and their brain doesn't have to try to process or figure it out you're asking a direct question and they can give you a direct answer right and so this gives great advice find a fatality fatality question and you will be comfortable saying Practice it so that you sound confident when saying it as the person will sense your own discomfort and it will lessen their trust that you can handle what they may say, right? And so in doing so, we don't wanna use um, any type of language that uh, gives an answer. So we don't wanna say things like, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? Right, because we've already biased the question uh, by saying that that's something negative, right? So I know you're not thinking about that. Um, oftentimes when we talk to um, younger people, we say, yeah, you're not stupid. You know, you're not thinking about suicide, right? You're a smart guy. You're not thinking about that. And so we've biased it already. And so the person will be less likely to trust you to tell you yes, because they know that you are kind of against it, right? Or you've assumed that it's for dumb people or for bad people or that type of thing, right? And so we don't want to do that. Um, one of my favorite indirects is, have you ever thought about going to sleep and not waking up? Have you ever wanted to go to sleep and not wake up, right? And so if you have a problem talking about death or um, asking directly, that's a really good um, indirect question. Um, have you thought about or wanted to go to sleep and never wake up, right? And it gives the person an out too. All right, so another um, component is if you hear of a threat, either from the person directly or from someone else, right? We wanna be direct and let the person know what we've learned. And so we don't wanna beat around the bush. We wanna to go to that person and say, hey, I heard um, that you know, you, uh, you were talking about taking your own life and talk about that and the seriousness of what they said, right? We wanna show concern and support naturally. Um, we don't wanna minimize the threat or the question um, about their personal problems, right? Um, so it could be anything going on at work, professionally, in family, and we don't want to start rationalizing it to our experiences. You're not doing this. You're not thinking about this because you're getting divorced, right? Come on, man. I got divorced twice and I'm okay, you know, because that person's relative experience is relative to their experience, right? And so it could be in world ending for them. And so they want to take their life because to them, it, their world is ending, right? And so we just want to be supportive and we don't want to judge or uh, critique their um their view of life right and so we protect their privacy like we're uh, bound to do with anything um but we can't tell them we'll keep it a secret right so when we're talking to this person they say hey i really don't want a lot of people knowing uh, we can't commit to that secret right um we want to offer to contact eap the employee assistance program or hr or any other internal resource uh, with them in the moment. And so that's like one of the best ways to help. That's the first help, right? And so, hey, can I help you get help right now together, right? Um, secondly, let me give you, um, let me call somebody for you, right? And lastly, let me direct you to a number that you can call, and that's the third best help, right? All those are very helpful things to do. Um, be prepared to call 911 or other help in emergencies. Right. And a lot of police departments across the country have uh, mental health 
branch or mental health trained officers. Um, they go by CIT, uh, Crisis Intervention Team is what it is. And they have those trainings across the country. And so if your department has it, you can you will know by calling 911 and you say, hey, do you have CIT trained law enforcement or CIT trained police officers? And they'll say yes. And you say, hey, I need one and you give them the address. And those officers have been trained in diversion and de-escalation, right? And so they either know how to de-escalate a person that's suicidal, or they can connect them to a mental health professional in the area, all right? And those are generally all over the country, um, and they're um, in some departments, and some they're not, right? And so you still call 911, and you would tell them the situation that you need uh, a wellness check, or you need them to come because you have a um, person that's suicidal, and they have policy and procedures, they'll come out and help, okay? Um, and you want to thank the person because it's really hard. Um, it's been explained to me, like, um, a person who's considering suicide is in a dark room and it's, it's pitch black, you know, and when a person talks to you about it, it's like somebody opens a door and a ray of light comes in. And so it's been explained to me like that a few times, more than once. And so they opened the door first because they were honest with you and they trusted you but you were that person's light also. And so you wanna thank them and say, hey, I appreciate you trusting me to tell me this and talk to me about this. It couldn't be easy, right? And so you build that rapport and um, it can give that person hope, right? And again, that's what we're, that's kind of the cornerstone of what we're doing is uh, instilling hope that there's hope that as bad as it is today, it can be a little bit better tomorrow and a little bit better the next day, right? Will your problem be over tomorrow? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But can it be a little bit better tomorrow? It can be. But you have to be here for that, right? <clears throat> Stay with the person. Um, if we talk to somebody and they admit and they confess or admit that they want to take their life, um, staying with them is of the utmost important. We don't want to leave a person that is thinking about or contemplating suicide um, alone um, for obvious reasons, right? We want to stay with them and connect them to an appropriate level of care, right? Right, so for the employee, uh, we want to help identify and reduce pain in an employee by listening. Again, we want to increase that sense of hope, right? And so one of the things that's really helpful is when we ask a person, have you thought about or attempted taking your life before, right? Whether they say yes or no, um, we ask, you know, is there somebody you can talk to that you trust? Um, is there a colleague that you trust? Um, you can talk to me if you want, you know, I'm here for you. Um, is there another colleague that you trust? Um, what about your family, friends, clergymen, uh, service people, service personnel, maybe if they're a veteran, um, somebody at the VA, right? Uh, those types of things. Um, one of the questions we ask is, do you know how you would, you, you're thinking about taking your life, right? And so that brings in decreasing capacity. And so we want to get rid of weapons, uh, get them referred to professional help to an appropriate level of care, right? And so if they have access to a firearm or to their, um, the way that they want to end their life, uh, pills, uh, rope, anything like that, we want to make sure they don't have access to it, right? And we want to get them referred to professional help. That should be the next step. Um, you want to offer support and say, hey, look, I'm here for you, and I know there's resources the company has. Let's use those. Let's find those together, right? Let's get together, and we can do that right now and call EAP or HR, and let's get some, get you to a better place, okay? And follow up. Without being inv invasive, um, it can be a text. It can be a call. Hey, just checking on you. Hope everything's well. Um, I'm here if you need me, those types of things. A quick call. Hey, I'm on the way in the office, but I was thinking about you just giving you a call. I uh, hope you're well, right? And that uh, not really time consuming, just showing the person that you're, they're on your mind and that you care. Uh, one of the biggest um, things that people who are thinking about suicide uh, endure is that they think that they are a burden on others. And it's an overwhelming thought. Um, kids think they're a burden on their parents and families. Employees think they're a burden on their colleagues and uh, managers and supervisors. And so, that's one of the hardest things to break um, or to prove this true to a person thinking about suicide. The best and really the only way to do that is consistently um, being there. And again, not invasive. We don't want to be bothersome or annoying. It's just the little things. It's just showing up. It's being genuine. And again, sending you know, maybe text or a phone call or whatever is appropriate and saying, hey, I'm just thinking about you. How's it going? How are you doing? Things like that and showing that person that you're involved, 
in their life and their well-being, right? And so that's uh, uber important. So self-care for managers, um, really big because you're carrying uh, not only your own uh, load and duties, but that of your team, right? Uh, we want to process those encounters with our uh, with your colleagues. Um, and remember to maintain confidentiality when you can and where you can. Um, you want to find self-care practices that work, right? Uh, yoga, meditation, exercise, time away from tech, hobbies, all those things are great. And so I like to level, um, call those things mindfulness or um, exercise or self-care, right? We wanna, I call them uh, layering. So things that I can do every day and those things are usually free, right? So like meditation, deep breathing, those things are free and you can do them anywhere. I give those, I give that tip to law enforcement, first responders, every industry you can think of. Um, breathing is one of the best things you can do. You can do it at your desk, you can do it in a meeting and it's just, you know, uh, smell the roses, blow out the candles in through the nose, out through the mouth as deep as you can, blow out as hard as you can. You can do it seven times, 10 times, you can do it a hundred times, do it seven or 10 times though. And you, your body physiologically changes, right? You change your hormone release. Um, you calm yourself down, you're back in the present. And it's one of the easiest things to do. Then outside of that, you've got yoga, um, you've got uh, massage, you've got uh, pedicures, uh, manicures, that type of thing. Uh, you got no screen time when it talks about time away from technology. So putting your phone on the dresser or on your nightstand or even charging it up and just saying, I'm going to go spend the next hour in my house, not, not looking at my phone. Right. And just disconnecting that way. Um, finding a hobby. Um, if you don't have a hobby, it's a good thing to get, um, uh, just to find, just to busy yourself and kind of like improve one thing, you know, um, be aware of your own stress level. Right. Notice when you start becoming short, especially at home, because um, sometimes we become short at home because we don't have that filter of professionalism on. Right. And it's easier to snap at our loved ones um, at the end of a rough day or work week or um, end of a tough project. And we're often asking ourselves, where did that come from? Right. So we want to watch our own stress levels and we want to know what helps us de-stress, right? What helps keep that stress to a minimum. And then uh, sometimes we can't help it. Um, in certain industries, we get busy around the holidays or we get, um, we get, we have, we're low staff across the country. Um, organizations are low staff. So not only what makes me stress, but what helps keep me have at low stress and then if i am if i do become stressed what helps me de-stress so always keeping those things in your tool belt and just being aware and watchful of yourself um use the eap it's one of the best resources we have in america right uh, most organizations uh, most companies have an eap program and it's uh generally free uh some most ses some sessions are free so a group of sessions are free um and you can talk about uh, a myriad of things not just mental health stuff but that's personal things you can talk about work and it's um your employer um uh it's confidential right so eap is um one of the best things going <clears throat> all right so EAP services are available to employees and any household members in dependents. A lot of people don't know that. So uh, if you want to call Kepro, call them. And if it's not you, but it's your significant other, your partner, or your children, dependents, or your parents, if they live with you, or your nieces, nephews, grandchildren, they can call EAP if they live there, right? Um, it's confidential. There's counselors available 24 seven. You can call after work on the way home. You can call on the way to work and uh, just let somebody talk to you. Uh, 365 days a year, 24 seven. It's 833-539-7285. And so it's up to six per in-person counseling sessions per issue per year, right? And so you call and you have an issue, six sessions for that. You got another issue, six sessions for that. And then that resets every year, all right? So um, it's pretty good. Management consultations, uh, financial and legal consultation and referrals, work life and convenience services. Um, uh, the website, uh, SOWI.MyLifeExpert.com and your company code is SOWI, so I, right? All right. 
So this um, code here, if you use your phone, take out your phone, open your camera, and point it at it on your in your camera, on your uh, viewer, you're going to get a link. If you tap that link, it's going to take you to the link here, App Smart Sheet, and there's a survey or a training evaluation. And we ask that you complete that just so you let us know how we're doing, how I did, um, and you can be as honest as you want, okay? And I appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody for coming out today um, and just um, being a great audience. And I hope you learned something today about suicide and um, awareness and prevention. And um, remember, any positive interaction 97% uh, of the times will will stop a suicidal attempt right so you can be the change in the world all right thanks again I'm Raheem Skinner and I appreciate you guys for showing up today